Another thing that uh, went on was that uh, there had been a series of epidemics over a period of about 100 years. The Byzantine Empire was racked with huge epidemics of plague, known to us from later in medieval times as the Black Death. Probably the same thing. It was probably that bubonic plague. Uh, but that took a huge toll on the resources and strength of the empire because people were dying like flies and, and uh, so it put them under incredible stress. So, so they've got all of this attack coming on from all of those different directions which tremendously weakened them right about the time that Muhammad comes on the scene. So, so that helps us to understand a little bit about the lay of the land. Some other things I want to mention about this Persian Empire, the Sassanid Empire, is that their official religion was a religion called Zoroastrianism. It uh, was a religion that was all about the great conflict between good and evil, light and dark, uh, had a supreme god who was the representation of all that is good and, and all that uh, uh, is constructive and creative in the world. Um, and uh, uh, Christians and Jews borrowed a lot of their ideas about God and the devil and heaven and hell and all of that kind of stuff from the Zoroastrians. The sort of unofficial minority religions within that empire were Christianity and Judaism. So, so anywhere that that empire has touched, you've got... Uh, not only Zoroastrian influence, but also Christian and, and Jewish influence. Now I want to move to the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, this map here kind of sketches for us the, the big picture part of the world that we're looking at. The Arabian Peninsula is uh, colored in over here in a little bit darker color. Um, and uh, that's Saudi Arabia in particular down at the bottom in the lighter color is what today is North and South Yemen and some of the Gulf states. You can see India over here. Uh, one of the things that's a very part of the big part of the later story is the port of Aden, which is uh, down here on the south coast of Yemen. It had been, in ancient times, an important port. But by the time uh, Muhammad came into the world, it had declined into sort of a dusty backwater fishing village. Why? Because the trade routes from India had sort of bypassed them. And so it, it, it fell on hard times. But when the British started taking over this part of the world, they discovered that that port was wonderfully situated for their purposes because it is almost equidistant from India, which was one of their primary colonies, from the Suez Canal, and from their holdings in East Africa, especially Kenya. And so it was a very important port for the British to refuel and park some military uh, forces and Navy ships to, to keep an eye on things and so on and so forth. But, but not terribly important at the time that we're talking about. What was important at the time that we're talking about was especially this area along the western coastline of the Arabian Peninsula, an area called the Hejaz. Um, that was the most developed part of the Arabian Peninsula in that there were some significant cities there. It was um, more fertile than much of the rest of the peninsula, much less of a desert, although from West Michigan point of view, we'd go there and think, man, there's no water anywhere to be found except salt. But uh, in, in contrast to the deserts of the interior, it was considered fairly, fairly fertile. Um, had some important cities. It runs really from the Gulf of Aqaba down here to, uh, to that city to the south, just north of what today is, um, is uh, Yemen. Uh, we have cities like Jeddah, which has long been an important port city. It's the point of access today for most of the pilgrims going to Mecca. Uh, it has a very ancient history as a port city where trade would come to and fro. 
Um, Mecca was a well-established trading center and also pilgrimage center because they had become very good at marketing uh, their shrine and all their idols and everybody come and it's going to be wonderful and oh, by the way, we love your money. Uh, tourism is not a new phenomenon. Um, north of uh, Mecca, there's a city on here called Medina that was originally known as Yathrib. Uh, after Muhammad and his followers went there, they changed the name to Medina, which is simply uh, Arabic for city. And it's an abbreviation of an Arabic phrase that means city of the prophet or radiant city. There's a couple of different descriptions that are used. So, so that's how Medina comes into being. Still very important cities today. So that's the lay of the land when we're beginning to talk about the birth of Islam. Um, as we go down south, you find Yemen. And um, that's this area on the map here, Sana'a, Yemen. Oman, the, the modern day Gulf states, because this is a modern map. In those days, Yemen was um, a part of what the Romans had called Arabia Felix, Happy Arabia. Why? Because it contrasted to what they called Arabia Deserta, deserted or desert, wilderness Arabia. It was considered uh, a, a, a good and fertile and happy place to be. It was also one of the prime producers of uh, myrrh and frankincense and a big player in the spice trade. So there was a lot of money that passed through there uh, on its way up the, up the Red Sea, toward the Mediterranean, toward Egypt, toward eventually Greece and Rome and so on and so forth. One of the interesting things about uh, Yemen is that in the 6th century, the king of Yemen actually uh, converted to Judaism. And so there's also in Yemen, as well as the influence of uh, Jewish traders who had been coming and going, uh, as well as the influence of Zoroastrians, uh, there's a Jewish influence from the fact that the king of Yemen had converted to, uh, to um, Judaism in the 6th century. Um, roughly again, sort of contemporary with the time of Muhammad. So it's not as if Muhammad did not know anything about Jews and Christians, and in fact, in the Quran, you will find quite a few references to the beliefs of Jews and Christians and to the writings of uh, Hebrew and Christian scripture. So, you know, there's this, this, this mix of things going on, of all sorts of cross-currents of ideas and philosophies and, and, and religious thinking uh, overlaid on the top of this huge base of just really polyglot pagan idolatry with, with every tribe and every group and every clan having their own, their own kind of private idols.